So good morning, everybody. And once again, thank you for your patience and for being with us this morning. Uh, first, we begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Pasmodi peoples uh, first signed with the British crown in 1726. We acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia for over 400 years, and we honor and offer gratitude to those ancestors of African descent who came before us to this land. So my name is Karen Zumi. I'm a consultant in inclusive education French with Student Services and Equity Branch at the EECD. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session titled An Introduction to FASD. Uh, for several months now, my colleagues and I, uh, Jolene and Marie, and, uh, and I have been in communication with Catherine Dunbar-Windsor, who is the executive director of FASD Newfoundland Network. And I will let Catherine introduce herself uh, shortly. Uh, in addition, the Student Service and Equity Branch directors and directors and executive director were also actively involved in planning today's session. Uh, Catherine has been gracious and flexible in meeting with uh, the branch on several occasions to ensure that the information you will hear today aligns with the inclusive education policy, uh, tier one universal approach uh, of support to all learners. Uh, so thank you, Catherine, for assisting us in our learning journey. Uh, first, I would like to say that Catherine's presentation will briefly address the lack of FASC diagnosis in Nova Scotia. However, the session will help us reflect on strategies that students with FASD diagnosis or not can benefit from on a daily basis in school or other settings. Second, uh, to ensure minimal disruption. So please keep your camera turned off and your mic off too, uh, just to ensure that there's good connectivity. So my camera on my end will, I probably gonna freeze, I have poor connection at the department. So if you see me freeze, I will be back in a few seconds. And um, you will also have a 10 minute break. So Catherine will let us know like when uh, she's ready after one of their slides, when the 10 minute break is, you can stretch your leg. So the session is scheduled for about three hours, but we most likely will not take that three hour time. So you'll have some flexibility to enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. So thank you for making time to of, out of your busy day and especially in your vacation to be with us today. And I'm going to give Catherine uh, the opportunity to present herself and start the presentation. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Karen, um, for that introduction and welcome to everybody here this morning. I, I'm sure we may have some, some late arrivals that will join in as well. Um, so as Karen mentioned, I'm Catherine. I'm the executive director of FASDNL. We're a pan-provincial organization in Newfoundland Labrador, but we're also the lead of a three-year Atlantic project across the four Atlantic provinces, focusing on FASD awareness, prevention, and capacity building. Um, and so some of our work takes us into Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI, and uh, we're very happy to collaborate and be able to uh, share some of the work that we've um, been working on and, and still uh, planning in the next few years. Um, with, with folks in Atlantic Canada. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University. Uh, my research looks uh, at FASD and substance use. Um, and uh, currently there is FASD research happening across Atlantic Canada. And you can you know, certainly check out our website uh, for more information about that. And I'm also a parent of FASD, of children with FASD. Uh, and so uh, you know, that for me is, is very much lived experience. And uh, certainly um, I'm happy to speak from that perspective, but for the most part, uh, you know, the, the examples and the training uh, talks about sort of these general scenarios and how they might look in a classroom environment. So um, there will be a couple of moments where I'll ask some true or false questions today. I welcome you to unmute. You can leave your camera off if you prefer, but just to unmute with a true or false note you know, we'll, we'll figure out the, the correct answers together. So uh, no pressure there if you say, you know, what you might feel is the wrong answer. Um, and also there's gonna be two opportunities for group discussion in the training. So to really sort of uh, encourage you to reflect on uh, scenarios and your own classroom environment and uh, applying some of the strategies that we talk about today. So with that said, um, I am going to begin sharing my screen. All right, 
So I think everything should be fine um, with the uh, slides. So I will begin. So we're actually going to start with a couple of true or false. So again, feel free to unmute and answer uh, what you think. Mothers had an easy choice not to drink while they were pregnant. True or false? False. False. Yeah, yeah. So we, we try to really uh, encourage participants to think that, um, you know, nobody drinks to harm a, a fetus or a baby. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, when we want to think about family and, and friends and community as being uh, supporters of healthy pregnancies as well, and that the burden is not only on uh, the mother. How about this one? All people with FASD have below average IQ. True or false? False. Yeah, that one's also false. So some people with FASD have a below average IQ. Many have an average IQ and some have an above average IQ. And I'll talk today about um, how FASD is really a brain injury and IQ is not a, pr a particularly helpful sort of measurement to, to think about how uh, somebody with FASD might need to be supported or um, how, you know, thinking about their, how, how well they function in a classroom environment. All right, third one, drinking small amounts of alcohol, especially early in the pregnancy can harm a fetus. True or false? True. Yeah, that one's true. Um, and it's interesting that there's a little bit more hesitation with that one. So and this, this goes back to the fact that there are so many myths still circulating that we all have heard perhaps or uh, heard others talk about. Um, any amount of alcohol can impact a fetus, even low amounts, even early in pregnancy. And so what we like to say is there's no known safe amount. And um, if, you know, stopping completely uh, from alcohol is not possible, then reducing alcohol consumption as much as possible certainly is best uh, for the duration of the pregnancy. All right, thanks for, uh, for participating there. So a couple of things to remember, nobody drinks with the intention to have a child with FASD. There is no known safe amount, type of alcohol or time during pregnancy. So beer is not safer than wine, wine is not safer than liquor. Um, alcohol as a substance uh, is what causes FASD. And we really try to operate in a strengths-based perspective that people with FASD can grow, improve, and function well uh, throughout their lives with proper support. Now, uh, FASD is a medical diagnosis, and it refers to a range of effects uh, resulting from prenatal alcohol exposure. You may have heard before uh, FASD was an umbrella term that was pre-2015. You might have heard words like FAS, PFAS, or ARND, and those are actually just older language referring to uh, pre-2015 uh, diagnostic standards in Canada, which are no longer uh, used. Uh, so we just refer to it as FASD um, as a diagnostic term. In order to get a diagnosis, most, um, or the recommendation is to have a diagnostic team. And depending um, on the team, there would be a pediatrician or a physician, there'd be an occupational therapist, a speech language pathologist, and a psychologist. There also may be a social worker, a case for in the, acting in the role of case manager. Um, and at times there can be private practice options in which um, there's sort of an ad hoc team, a psychologist uh, in private practice may refer to other specialists for various assessments, uh, receive those assessments back and then make a diagnosis. So we see that model exists as well in Atlantic Canada. So just to give you a sense of the fetal development, um, FASD is a lifelong disability that impacts both the brain and the body. And, um, and so alcohol consumption during pregnancy can impact not only the brain, but other things such as the heart, such as eyes, ears, teeth. Um, there are a number of conditions associated with, um, you know, bodily conditions associated with uh, prenatal alcohol exposure. But if you look at this diagram, you'll notice that the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord are really developing throughout the duration of the pregnancy, which is why there's no known safe uh, time during pregnancy to consume alcohol. Now, in terms of um, diagnosis, uh, there, you know, the, 
there are a number of psychological tests that are administered to make a diagnosis. Um, and sometimes a psychologist or uh, may be aware of an IQ or may be curious about it, but IQ is not generally a helpful metric for understanding how people are impacted by FASD. And the reason for that is because the vast majority of people who have FASD also have an, a normal IQ. The, the challenge about FASD and what makes it complex is that people may not be able to sort of perform at the level that their IQ indicates. And so this is the difference between their executive functioning abilities or their cognitive abilities um, and their IQ. And so when we want to understand educational success for students, we really need to think beyond the IQ measurement altogether and look at other, um, other ways that the child uh, or youth might be impacted um, because the looking at IQ alone can be misleading. Now you might say, okay, I don't have that many students with FASD or I might've had one or two, you know, with the diagnosis. So certainly there's an issue of under diagnosis, um, particularly in Atlantic Canada. Um, so when we wanna understand how many people are actually impacted by FASD, we have to look at prevalence data. And what prevalence data in Canada is showing us is that approximately 4% of the general Canadian population have an FASD, although it may not be diagnosed, okay? So there's a difference between having it and it being diagnosed. And so we're referring to how common it is that people have FASD. So 4% of the people, you know, walking down the sidewalk, walking through the airport would have FASD. We see higher prevalence for children in care, for justice populations, and for new Canadians, given uh, different sort of social and cultural practices of alcohol around the world and different access to information, health promotion, uh, health care in general, and so on. So we see some variation there. Uh, indigenous peoples are not listed in this list for a very specific reason, which is that we do not have conclusive data that FASD is actually more common in indigenous communities. Rather, in Canada, many, FA, many indigenous communities have made it a priority of paying attention to FASD and having FASD coordinators and uh, strategies and a number of different types of work across Canada, which means that we might see more diagnosis in Indigenous communities, but keeping in mind in di um, diagnosis and prevalence are not the same thing. So uh, FASD occurs everywhere where there is alcohol and FASD is the most common non-genetic birth defect in North America. At 4%, it's two and a half times more common than autism. So think for a moment how many students you've taught with autism. You're talking two and a half times more students that would be impacted by FASD. It's 19 times more common than cerebral palsy and 28 times more common than Down syndrome. But because of stigma, because of misinformation or myths around alcohol and pregnancy or um, you know, myths around thinking about who drinks um, and judgment and shame associated with admitting or sharing that somebody has consumed alcohol during pregnancy, it's not diagnosed as much. And sometimes when a diagnosis is known, the diagnosis might not be shared outside of the family. If we look at Nova Scotia, then based on that 4% prevalence rate, we'd be looking at uh, over 40,000 people impacted by um, FASD within the province based on the 2022 um, population uh, available from Statistics Canada. So we're talking about a significant, uh, a significant section of um, Nova Scotia's population impacted by FASD. And then we might think, well, who drinks during pregnancy then? And so really what we know is that it's women of all ages, incomes, educations, cultures. You can be a light, moderate, or heavy drinker and have a child with FASD. You might be uh, somebody who attends a couple of events, uh, you know, a barbecue, a bachelorette party, uh, a wine and cheese with work, and consume alcohol early in your pregnancy when you don't even know you're pregnant and still have a child with FASD. So we really have to sort of think beyond the idea that uh, women who have children with FASD are, are alcoholic or 
um, you know, sub engaging in substance, heavy substance use, that might be the case, but it also, we know that there are many people who have FASD um, where that wasn't the case um, during the pregnancy. And so for all of these reasons, because we don't say things like FASD is 100% preventable, we want to recognize that FASD prevention is important, but so is um, recognizing how complex it is to address FASD prevention because we have to consider things like trauma and poverty and isolation and lack of social supports and lack of awareness. Um, healthcare providers saying a little bit of alcohol is okay. We have a lot of um, various elements that occur that really um, make saying things like it's 100% preventable harmful in that it can increase stigma and contribute to reasons why women might not share that they have um, concerns about their alcohol use during pregnancy. So what might you do as a teacher? Well, I'll encourage you to sort of think about this question and we can revisit later in our discussion. Um, many people uh, who might not work in an, an organization with FASD or they might not do specific FASD work, but they might get involved when there's uh, a September awareness, FASD awareness month, or they might try to think of, okay, FASD is a possibility in the students in my classroom this year. They might try to um, be compassionate or try to be aware of the language that they use to describe um, people who have FASD or, um, or their families as well. So there's lots of things you can do and I would encourage you all to think about what you can do as a teacher, perhaps in your classroom, your school, or in your community. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the challenges. Um, so that was a little bit of a brief overview of FASD as a condition. And I'll just note that I'm gonna list a number of challenges. And I really want you all to consider that not every person you meet with FASD is going to have all of these challenges. FASD is a spectrum disorder where we see people quite differently impacted based on all kinds of factors, such as their genetics, the nutrition that their mom had during pregnancy, uh, stress levels during pregnancy, uh, alcohol consumption, that when it was, how much alcohol, and so on. So you can have biological siblings that are quite differently impacted from one another, but that have all had um, alcohol exposed pregnancies. So when I talk about these challenges, it's really important to think, okay, I'm not looking for a student who has all of these, but rather do I have students that might show some of these challenges? And then later in the training, we're gonna spend time talking about strengths and strategies so that we can really meet the challenges that I talk about here. All right, so we're gonna do another uh, couple of true or false. So feel free to unmute. Uh, children with FASD will outgrow their difficulties in adulthood. True or false? False. Yeah, that one's false. FASD is lifelong. Um, and this can be quite challenging, particularly around the age of 18, moving from the, you know, the youth adolescent world into adulthood. Um, society expects a lot of adults and sometimes people with FASD might struggle to live up to those expectations. But um, we also want to think that the types of supports that somebody needs or can benefit from might change over the course of their life. A 10 year old might need very different supports than a 25 year old, but we also wanna think about the fact that they likely will need support throughout their life or at least have access to support should it be needed. How about this one? Behavior problems linked to FASD are often due to poor parenting skills. Yeah, so that one's also false. Um, you know, certainly because FASD is a condition that impacts the brain, there can be behavioral um, challenges that arise and there can be issues with um, people's ability to process information. So instructions, rules, directions, all of those things can be uh, impacted. And then that can be frustrating for the adults involved, um, parents and teachers and so on. And so we really try to approach um, behavior issues as um, something that's brain-based 
and not due to parenting. Oftentimes, uh, the parenting required for uh, people with FASD might look a little bit different um, than parenting kids without FASD, um, but certainly that doesn't mean it's bad parenting. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about information processing and why that's such a challenge um, when we're thinking about FASD. So people with FASD uh, can have sort of a slower uh, language development. Their communication and expressive language may take longer to develop, but once it's developed, and again, this is gonna depend on the person, you might find that their ex verbal expressive skills actually exceed what they understand. So what that means is, I like to say it as they can talk the talk, right? But might not be able to understand the talk coming back to them. Um, this can be an ability to use words correctly in a sentence, but not understand the meaning of the word. Um, it can be being able to issue a, a few statements or repeat information to you verbatim sometimes, but may not be able to uh, comprehend uh, or at least not as quickly comprehend uh, the information that you're saying back to them. There may be in children um, a slower rate of, of uh, development around expressive language. And so things like uh, vocabulary might be slower, complex language structure, um, or even specific terminology for things, um, you know, calling toast warm bread instead of calling it toast because the word toast, uh, has, they've just forgotten it for the moment. Um, or, or mixing up categories of things, you know, calling a goat a sheep or a sheep a goat, but knowing that they're both within the family of farm animals. Um, so these are kind of little um, examples of like immature vocabulary or immature syntax that you might see in older kids who have FASD. They may interpret others' words, actions, or body movements. So things like having crossed arms or, you know, like looking like you're thinking hard about something. Um, they may pick up on that. They might interpret that as being about them. Um, whereas maybe you're just thinking, where did I place my pen? You know, so uh, that certainly can occur. Um, and uh, trouble following multiple directions. So if you give more than one direction at a time, you might find that kids with FASD um, either forget one or two of the other directions or that they scramble them. Um, and mix up what they're supposed to do in what order. And this has to do with challenges with sequencing um, and being able to do things in the right order. It also means that having trouble with sequencing and scrambling of information affects things like math problems that have multiple steps, uh, novels that have a plot line that's developed slowly over time, uh, there's a lot of ways that those types of issues can present in children or, and youth with FASD. Then in terms of um, executive functioning, this is sort of our, you know, the organizational part of our, our brain that helps us with our planning and our problem solving. And it's an area where um, people can really struggle um, with, with people who have FASD can really struggle. And so, um, you know, I, I sort of describe this as like, what helps you get out the door in the morning? Um, you know, knowing what time you have to get up, knowing what time you have to, uh, you know, have your breakfast, leave, what time is your bus, what time, you know, how long is the, uh, the traffic gonna take? All of those things, when we do that to go to work, we're using our executive functioning. The challenge is, is that a lot of the solutions that we give, quote unquote solutions that we give to people who have FASD or ADHD or autism who struggle with executive functioning is that it requires executive functioning in order to improve executive functioning. So how do we support executive functioning from a classroom perspective? Um, and so we might do things like having, um, you know, a visual schedule. We might do things like maintaining the same structure and repetition in our classroom environment. Uh, things that help people know what to expect next can help support executive functioning without expecting the person to do it entirely on their own. 
Um, also abstract reasoning and abstract thinking as a connecting point to executive functioning. So it is an issue. So having um, challenges with time as abstract and money. Also math um, is relatively abstract depending on um, the topic and the grade level. So we can see uh, struggles with that. And um, there are some ways that we'll, we'll talk about later of different strategies that can be used to help make those things more concrete um, within the classroom. Um, a big connecting point though, and an overarching um, element of people who have FASD is this challenge of learning from past mistakes. And so if we don't learn from past mistakes, we often repeat the same mistakes. And when we do that, other people might get frustrated with us because we should know the difference by now, or we've been taught this before. And so it's not that people who have FASD can't learn, they can, but it might take more effort and more repetition than with somebody who doesn't have FASD. So ensuring that we approach our repetition with patience and with strategies can be incredibly helpful uh, for people who might struggle with um, with learning from past mistakes. And then from a sensory perspective, um, quite similar to autism, uh, people who have FASD may also have um, just different challenges around sensory integration. So bright lights, loud noises, tags, uh, you know, wool hats, materials, those types of things. Um, certain foods, and uh, knowing where their body is in space. So being a little bit clumsy. All of those things make learning more difficult ultimately. And, um, and so we'll talk a little bit later in the strategies on how we can um, sort of minimize some of those sensory um, elements around students to help them have more time to sort of calm their nervous system and be able to take in information that they're being taught or be able to, to do their work um, a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more of a focused manner. Now, there's also other impacts of having FASD. So um, other pe peers and students and other students may notice that something's a little bit different about a particular kid or group of kids. Um, they may have a hard time making friends, or they might do okay with making friends, but have a hard time keeping friends. Sometimes peers can pick up on the fact that a child or person with FASD seems a little bit young for their age. Um, that sort of dismaturity that we see with uh, kids with FASD can become evident to peers, and therefore it can be harder for them to, to find and maintain friendships. Um, they may have experienced multiple losses and this and, and forms of trauma. And this relates back to the overrepresentation of kids in care. And um, so being removed from their family's home for whatever reason might still be um, you know, a trauma for that child. Um, and trauma and FASD can be quite linked um, in terms of the impacts of how trauma affects us can be quite similar to how FASD affects us. And then if a person has had has both FASD and trauma, both of those things are intermingling. You might also notice that uh, someone with FASD has hygiene issues or they might forget to take a shower. And again, this goes back to the need for gentle repetition and strategies um, to ensure that, that you know, people are, are meeting their hygiene needs or whatnot. I'll give you an example. A family I've worked with had uh, a teenage boy, uh, he would forget the steps he had to do in the shower. So they printed off um, visual pictures, laminated them and placed them in the shower uh, up on the wall so that he could, you know, shampoo, conditioner, soap, right? In that order, rinse and then get out. Uh, and they couldn't figure out why he was getting a shower every day, but his hair looked dirty. And uh, he wasn't able to sort of explain to them, well, I don't know, I'm getting my shower every day. And when they looked in the shower, the visual image reminding him to use shampoo on his hair had fallen over. So for a number of showers, he'd been using conditioner and then soap on his body and completely forgetting to do the shampoo. 
And, and that's why his hair was looking dirty, even though he was getting a shower every day. So sometimes it really can be something so simple. And this is a teenager. So again, we want to think about some of these um, challenges can present themselves throughout uh, people's lives. Now, functioning unevenly in school and work is a significant concern when it comes to teachers and testing of students' knowledge. So um, you might teach a student or a resource teacher might teach a student who has FASD in a small group uh, environment on a Monday, and they do really well with the concept that was taught. They have a really uh, great time, you know, they understand it, they've been able to do it correctly. And the next day or Wednesday, they don't remember it at all. And you're thinking to yourself, it's like they weren't even taught. And sometimes this can be misinterpreted as willful disobedience or willfully just not making an effort. And really what we know is this is related to um, very un uneven functioning when it comes to learning material. And so uh, for material to really stick for students with FASD, it requires over teaching, practicing, uh, over practicing, reducing the number of steps or tasks, reducing the number of problems that might need to be completed. There's a whole lot of different strategies that we can use to help with this. Uh, what we can also think about is when we test students um, for reading comprehension, you know, their sight words, uh, their written comprehension, whatever the, 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 the test might be, um, keeping in mind that if you test them a different day of the week, you might end up with very different results. Uh, and this relates to sort of a plateau, like a climb, and then a plateau learning curve that individuals with FASD can have. And of course, all of these elements that I've just spoken about can impact our self-esteem naturally. Um, and so, um, you know, encouraging people to uh, find their strengths, and we'll talk about that a little bit after, uh, can really help with self-esteem and knowing what they're really good at and not just what they struggle with. So all of these sort of different impacts that I've mentioned People with FASD then might be viewed as non-compliant or uncooperative or resistant or unmotivated. And we really wanna think about these not as character flaws, but as a di direct impact of alcohol on the brain. And when we do that, we can think of it more the way of a brain injury, the way if, it, if somebody was involved in a car accident and had a, a brain injury as a result, we wouldn't be mad at them for the way that their brain was impacted by that accident. We would work to accommodate the brain injury. And so with FASD, we have to think about the same thing. Now, I'm sure as you know, um, teachers in 2022, you have many students who have different diagnoses and depending on their age and depending on um, a couple of other factors, you might see a lot of overlap or multiple diagnoses um, amongst your students, um, including, you know, ADD, ADHD, autism as well. Um, but it, these other diagnoses that you see here on this slide are quite common uh, to also see with FASD. Now, sometimes it's a co-occurring diagnosis that the individual truly does have more than one diagnosis. And sometimes it's a misdiagnosis. The reality is it's easier to diagnose ADHD from a process perspective and a resource perspective than it is to diagnose FASD. And so we have that occurring. We also have sometimes intentional misdiagnosis in which we've had many healthcare providers tell us over the years that we've been active as an organization that in um, you know pediatricians and so on that will tell us that they have intentionally diagnosed autism when they know that the child has FASD because autism an autism diagnosis gets the child and the family more supports than a diagnosis of FASD. The, tr the trouble with that is it skews the data obviously to making us in making it appear that autism is more common than it is and that FASD is less common than it actually is. But it also means that some of the strategies and supports that are available for people who have autism are not necessarily helpful for people who have FASD. And so 
it can be, um, it, it can be, a, it's a challenging reality, this um, misdiagnosis and, and this practice as well. And then of course, you know, all of those disorders that you just saw on the previous page and those conditions or the previous slide, um, that's how we sort of understand the person and the symptoms that the person might have as something that's, you know, sort of quote unquote wrong or different with them. When we think about trauma, we're not thinking about, well, what's wrong with you? We're thinking about what happened to you. And so what happened to you can be anything that overwhelms a person's ability to cope. And, um, you know, that could be from child abuse, neglect, witnessing violence, um, you know, what might be traumatic for one sibling could be not traumatic for the next. Uh, so really trauma can be also very individual and very subjective to an extent. So many people who have FASD have also experienced trauma. In fact, trauma just is incredibly common. Many people in general have experienced trauma throughout their lives. And so we want to consider trauma and how these difficult experiences can also overwhelm a person's ability or capacity to cope and how that in combination with FASD means that we have to take certain steps to highlight people's strengths and find strategies that are supportive. And when we do that, we're really thinking about trauma-informed practice. And trauma-informed practice, or TIP, is built on those four principles that you see listed on this slide. Trauma awareness, safety and trustworthiness, choice and collaboration, and strength-based um, strength and skill building. And that can really be anything. So if you're in a classroom, you might say, okay, choice and collaboration, how might I integrate that? Well, that could be um, having the child choose where you do uh, a one-on-one -on -one assessment. That might be uh, uh, somebody getting to pick out which fidget that they choose to use off of a table of options. Um, it could be safety and trustworthiness could be if you have to take notes about a child, um, letting them read the notes uh, or telling them why you take the notes that you do it because you might forget or you work with a lot of kids and there's nothing there that they need to worry about. Because having things written down about you that you're not able to know what is written can be a very triggering experience for people, especially if they've had child protection involvement um, and have had social workers writing things down. Um, and then that knowing that that resulted in their removal from their home. So keeping trauma in mind and the way that we can integrate little trauma-informed practice uh, principles into our day-to-day -day teaching and work with people who have FASD and just people in general can be incredibly helpful. Okay, so um, I will, I think what we'll do, I'll open it up and see if there's any questions at this point about anything that I've mentioned so far. Hi, Catherine, it's Susan. Um, I come from a behavior background and I noticed um, one of your points earlier was about how um, these students don't usually respond to uh, any type of like reward system. I'm wondering, are you going to elaborate on that at some point? Yeah, I absolutely can. So I would say that that depends on the type of a reward system. Reward systems that take away um, let me give an example. Um, somebody keeps their desk clean four days in a row, but the fifth day it's messy. A reward system that would penalize or take away something earned for how clean their desk was on Thursday, um, on Friday would not work. Those types of like taking away rewards, um, not helpful at all. Re in terms of rewards that allow people to build they can be helpful for some. It really depends on the student or the person, their age, um, and how motivated they are. So in terms of rewards, it could be, um, it, it really comes down to uh, figuring out what motivates that particular person. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, already just from rewards, reward, you know, um, strategies in general. Um, maybe it's that they get to choose the movie 
if that really matters to them or they're really into music. So they get to choose the soundtrack while you're driving in the car to the grocery store um, or, you know, they get to choose the sport that gets played at recess. Uh, those types of rewards of when you know what the person's really invested in can be more effective, certainly, than just earning a sticker at the end of the week or earning a coin that's sort of more generic. Um, but again, I would say that that's something that really depends on the on the person. I've had I've used reward charts, charts with my own kids, and they were very effective. Thank you, Karen. All right, so we're going to get started on. Um, the strengths, and then we'll do strategies. And so for the strengths, I have a couple of more true or false for you. People with FASD are typically unmotivated and don't take responsibility for their actions. True or false? False? Yeah, that one's false. Um, so certainly, um, People are not trying to be difficult, right? Uh, of course, and then um, they might be having trouble paying attention. They might be having trouble remembering, uh, you know, instructions or rules. Um, and so we want to try to think about, well, what's the reason for the behavior that we're seeing? Um, because generally, it's not that they don't want to take responsibility or uh, are not motivated. About this one, people with FASD can experience many successes in life with work, family, and community with good supports. True. Yeah, that one's true as well. So um, some people who have FASD uh, have cognitive impairments, but not all. And so um, that means that there's a sort of broad range of how people are impacted and then the types of supports that they might need uh, in order to um, you know, be supported well throughout their lives. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, because certainly we see that there are people that might have more of a, a behavioral impact or they, they need a lot of support with executive functioning, while other people, it's much more of a cognitive impact and they need a lot more support in learning concepts and school material and so on, but might not have the behavioral concerns that somebody else does. But first, I'll just touch on some of the common strengths. So um, people with FASD can be um, incredibly friendly, affectionate, um, really, really valuing fairness, um, paying attention to fairness. Uh, I laugh because this is something I see all the time. Um, and so, um, you know, these might be the little hmm, tip offs that, you know, somebody you, you think could have FASD, um, but they also have a lot of these great strengths as well. And, and it can help us um, really develop helpful strategies when we, we know how to support people through their strengths. So they might be very athletic, um, good with animals, and very talkative, um, and find it easier, easy to create conversation with others. Hands-on learning um, can be a strength and also a way of, um, you know, integrating strategies into learning as well. They may have a lot of artistic or musical ability. Um, and uh, they may have long-term uh, visual memory that's quite strong as well. So really thinking about how do we integrate these types of strengths into uh, how we develop strategies is the, is the big takeaway here. Um, strengths are so unique to a person, it's hard to generalize here. Um, but certainly it's a way to also address the, the self-esteem issues that might be occurring as well. So when we identify strengths, we can help improve the outcomes. So we might say, well, what do they or we do well? What do they or we enjoy? And what are their or our best qualities, like depending on who we're referring to? And so if we think about this and we think that, okay, the individual is the red circle in the middle, and then we have the family and caregivers, the service and support providers or teachers and the community, that are all there to help support those strengths. And so what does supporting somebody's strengths look like in a classroom or school environment? Um, and so 
you know, and helping people with FASD to understand their own strengths. It's fine for us to understand other people's strengths, but for somebody with FASD to understand their own strengths and to do sort of exercises that help people do that is very, can be very, very helpful um, and really help with, with developing self-esteem. Um, and uh, finding their interests and being attracted to activities that are around their interests as well. Now, there's a couple of um, video uh, links here. You're going to receive a handout at the end of the training that has a number of links to video resources and uh, document resources. And these two links are in that, um, that resource list. So, um, both of them relate to teaching and FASD, and also this focus on strengths. All right, so let's move right on into strategies with a couple more true or false. Because people are living, people living with FASD live with permanent brain damage, there is little you can do to improve their circumstances. False? Yeah, that one's false. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that we can do um, to support people with FASD. And a lot of what we can do involves changing the environment rather than trying to change the child or the person. All right, so we're gonna do, we're gonna start this off um, with a scenario discussion. So we'll, we'll discuss this as a group. And, um, you know, you can sort of keep in mind some of the things that we've talked about so far. We haven't named too many strategies, so, um, just going off of what you're already doing, you can also think about this. So we have Mark and his classrooms located near a music room. The teacher has been keeping the window open during the warm weather and the construction crews are completing some work nearby. Mark struggles with not completing the instructions given to him, then transition from free time to instructional time and with staying still. So those are his three sort of things that he's struggling with most in class. How can Mark be better supported? What changes could be made to improve the classroom experience and learning for Mark, his classmates, and the teacher? So um, you're welcome to turn on your cameras, or you're also just welcome to unmute, uh, or you can use the raise hand function um, to sort of think about, well, what, how would you address this? Um, or perhaps you have something similar happening or have dealt with it in, in, in school. And how did you address it and how might that fit here? So I'm, I'm open to hearing your thoughts on um, how Mark could be um, better supported. I would say if Mark has sensory sensitivities, being near the music room and having the open window with the construction crew might be uh, difficult for him. So maybe some noise canceling headphones or um, a, a more quiet place to uh, to spend some time would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. So noise canceling headphones, of course, being um, a resource that could be purchased for him, um, if possible, a quiet space, an alternate quiet space. Anything else? I wonder if some additional opportunities for movement, mm -hmm. um, kind of built into the day and into some of the transitions. Yeah, that's a great one. To, to help target some of the extra energy uh, with staying still. And maybe with not um, completing um, the tasks, like chunking the tasks for him, like breaking it down into small steps so he can see success quicker in completing a task. Yep, and giving him one instruction at a time if possible. Yep, anything else? You so, had mentioned, okay. oh, sorry, I was, go ahead. Go you ahead. had mentioned having a visual schedule, something that he can see, you know, what the transition is going to be and hopefully um, be proactive in having something that is non-preferred followed by something preferred. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he could have something like, so for the um, transition from free time to instructional time, um, this is also a similar challenge for students who are moving from screen time to non-screen time, especially if they're motivated by screen time, is giving a, the transition warning. So because time is abstract for people who have FASD, well, time is abstract anyway. So for people who have FASD, they can struggle with time. 
And, you know, two minutes or five minutes when you're doing something you really enjoy flies by. And it feels like forever when you're doing something you hate. I think that's maybe a universal experience for all of us. But um, so the, the time warnings or transition warnings, um, you know, hey, Mark, in five minutes, we're going to be going to do our, you know, our math or instructions or, or time on the carpet or, or whatever the grade appropriate next step would be, could be helpful. Also, I don't know if you can sort of, um, there's something here, there's a time timer. The time timer, uh, which can be purchased, I'm sure you're probably likely familiar with those, uh, can be very helpful as the amount of red decreases um, over time until it finally gives a little ding. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, time timers, I purchased one for one of my children's classes and I just bought, I bought it for her, you know, but I gave it to the teacher and the teacher put it on the, uh, the ledge underneath the whiteboard where the markers are kept. And the whole class thought it was for them and they all liked it. And they all asked to use the, not to use it themselves, but to have the time timer used because they found that it helped them all with transitions and knowing when recess was going to be or whatever. So thinking about the time timer then is not necessarily something that you have to do for everybody, but, or sorry, for one specific person. And then they feel that it might be for them and be more resistant to it. But when it's targeted for everybody, then, uh, you know, we could maintain a sense of openness to the, to the resource there. Um, the other idea too, I liked the idea of movement. Um, has anyone ever experienced uh, a student who they allow to stand up while doing their work, as long as they're sort of standing still? Is that something that's permitted or encouraged for students yeah. who have a hard time sitting? We've definitely seen it. Um, you know, we're trying to get more standing desks like for each classroom to have like one or two standing desks because it's just, you know, flexible seating, like that would count too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was there somebody else who was going to add something there? Okay, yeah, so uh, the ability to stand can be sort of just this diff a different way of kind of harnessing people's um, energy that they have, um, especially if they're quite active and, and struggle with sitting. And um, especially, yeah, standing desks are great because, you know, if as long as they're not blocking the person behind them or the standing desks are sort of off to the side, it can be incredibly helpful um, for students who have FASD. Uh, and the other component or that I was going to mention um, related to the instructions, whenever possible, um, if it's something significant uh, of, a, say, a, a big assignment, um, a big project, whatever, giving the instructions in written format as well as verbal can be very, very helpful. And this goes also for junior high, high school, uh, at, which is a time when we tend to see teachers telling students instructions and students have, there's an expectation that they'll remember it and write down the necessary information. Um, very, very difficult for students who have FASD to come home and say, oh, you know, mom, dad, we have a project due in science. It's a big science fair but I can't remember if it's due tomorrow or three weeks from now, you know? And so having either through a Google Classroom type of digital format or a paper uh, format, having those type, th that amount of information and instructions that require multiple steps, especially for larger pieces of work that do require working on something in chunks can be very, very helpful, um, especially with supporting a family to be able to help support the child um, to get the work done. So another little tip there. All right, well, you know, hopefully the construction will be done soon outside of Mark's classroom. The music room is sort of one of those more challenging things that, you know, the school layout is the school layout and, and can be difficult to change. All right, <clears throat> when we're planning strategies and strategy implementation for students who have FASD, we wanna think about how we individualize the approach. Viewing each person, each student as a true individual. So that's why I said to you at the beginning of the challenges, you might meet somebody who has FASD who has some of these challenges, but not all, and some combination of challenges. 
And then the same goes for strategies. Not all strategies are going to work with all people who have FASD. And it can be tricky to, if we implement a whole pile of strategies at the same time or for the same activity, to know which is working and which ones are not working. So we want to think about going slow with strategies, trying something, um, seeing how it works. And then we can decide if we want to keep it or take it out and add a different strategy. We want to try to separate the person from the behavior and ask what is the causing this behavior? What behavior does this feel like? So this is a particularly helpful question to ask when it comes to people who have FASD because of dismaturity, because of the fact that they might have the verbal, they might be chronologically 14 with the verbal expressive verbal abilities of a 16 year old, but the language processing of a 12 year old, the social skills of a 10 year old, like there, it really can be all over the map. And so, you know, by age 13, for example, we might be thinking, oh, they're supposed to act responsibly or they're supposed to be able to meet a deadline after being told once uh, when the deadline was and what the expectations were. But in reality, somebody who's 13 chronologically with FASD might still need reminding, they might need visual cues, um, they might need prompting. And so we wanna think about what behavior does it feel like and address the behavior it feels like versus the chronological age, because ultimately the chronological age is here nor there uh, when it comes to a person's ability to, to manage life. And then develop a process um, for prioritizing those interventions. What is the most important intervention or strategy that can, needs to be implemented first? Let's work with that. Because when we create one change, we change all, everything really. So we want to think about carefully um, what's most significant, what's going to help this person the most, um, what, and that, that should be the, the thing, the strategy that we can change first. And then our job as the adult working with people who have FASD is to reframe the behavior. So if we understand that behaviors are caused by brain damage, we try not to assume then that the breaking of rules or not following instructions or needing repetition or more support or having a lot of questions that need to be answered, it's not really purposeful, right? It's what a person is struggling with or needing in order to understand what's going on. So we want to try to think of behaviors as can't instead of won't. And so here we see this little chart. Instead of saying, oh, they won't cooperate, they're really lazy, or they're telling lies, we might say, okay, well, they're not getting it. What can I do to help them get it? Sorry, somebody rang my doorbell and I have a very verbal, expressive German Shepherd. Um, so they might say, okay, this person's lying. And really we might need to understand, well, they're filling in the blanks, they're overexcited. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about sequencing. People who have FASD can struggle with sequencing. And this can also be mixing up events that actually happened or what we call confabulation, which is mixing imagined and real events. So it's not that they're trying to lie about what happened on the playground with Johnny. It's that what happened at yesterday's recess on the playground and today's got mixed up. And um, so being able to, to tease those things apart can be very, very helpful. And that's where I say it's sort of, our job to try to, uh, to negotiate or to manage those, um, those tasks and reframing the behavior. Then we wanna to try to ex create external supports. What are the supports that are available? What kind of guidance can we give in addition to the basic of what's offered? Um, and supervision is really key. Uh, even for teenagers, or especially for teenagers with FASD. Absolutely. Especially because many teenagers who have FASD and, and children too, but when we see the adolescent years, it's a little bit more worrisome. They can be quite naive and gullible and quite eager to please and quite eager to uh, do things that they think might get them accepted by their peer group. 
And so for that reason, they might be the ones who take the fall and admit something that they didn't actually do, or they might do things that they know they might not be supposed to do because they think that's going to win the attention or friendship of the people that they're with. And so really trying to identify opportunities for added support is as much eyes on time as you can have is a key uh, with people with FASD um, throughout those years. Helping people with FASD then recognize and avoid situations that might cause them problems. So very early on, uh, one of my kids was very overwhelmed with math. She knew this. She knew that math was her struggle point. And she could identify it was her struggle point because she said, I can feel, it feels like heat coming up my body. And I think what she was describing, this was like a grade two way of describing the feeling of anxiety about math. And so helping them recognize that sort of bodily sensation or the feeling and having a couple of strategies in place for what they do when they have that feeling a realization. So I can put up my hand and ask Miss for help, or I can do this, I can do that, having a plan. Um, we also want to try to provide a model for appropriate behavior and confidence. So any type of grouping, um, grouping somebody who has FASD with somebody, another peer who might be a really helpful kind of model of appropriate behavior and confidence can be very, very helpful um, for for somebody with FASD to learn from a class peer. And then looking for how we're gonna foster interdependence, not independence. We, we tend to think of uh, life as very linear and, and the, the progression to more and more independence happens in very similar ways for everybody. And we know that that's not the case. And so we wanna think about um, how can we foster interdependence for people who have FASD. So some of the ways that we can do that are to um, use some of the strategies. And so we can think about adapting the environment, trying to provide calm, order, and relaxed organization, uh, reducing visual clutter on the walls and desks, having a defined space. So the cubby where you put your the lunch and um, you know, sweater and coat or whatever, uh, defining common areas versus shared areas, those types of things. Um, it could be uh, min minimizing the auditory and visual distractions through the environment, or like we mentioned earlier, through something like noise canceling headphones. Um, that could be helpful for a particular person. It could be, um, you know, using, um, limiting the use of, of loud announcements or maybe having a little noise, like a little bell or a little um, sound that you play to, um, to notify the class that there's something going on. Um, another thing that it can be quite um, anxiety inducing for people who have FASD are unexpected events, such as fire drills. And so if at all possible, giving students just a little bit of warning that there might be a fire drill, a planned fire drill, you know, in September and October when they practice um, can be very, very helpful for this is their opportunity to practice. This is their opportunity to, to show um, all of the things that they know about fire safety and getting out safely and so on. Um, because the unexpected and not really realizing or understanding it to be a drill can be quite, um, quite uh, stressful. And we want to think about how we address sensory issues, recognizing those triggers and reading body language before the outburst happens. Um, and encouraging the person to know those themselves, right? How do they feel when they're going to be um, when they're getting overwhelmed. Providing regular breaks can be helpful. Um, little breaks to get up and move around, uh, little breaks to change where they're focusing their eyes, um, maybe providing a fidget. Fidgets, I'm sure as you all know, can be very helpful for some and very distracting for others, really depends on the person. 
And also uh, weighted vests or lap blankets can be helpful for some. Now, we can also work to create structure and routine. So that might be knowing a predictable classroom schedule, um, set a routine and plan for the day, no, helping uh, people know what their plan is. I always say there's nothing more dangerous than free time uh, when it comes to uh, kids with FASD. Uh, so limiting, giving choice, but limiting the options, right? Uh, maybe two or three options versus 10 or 15 options. Uh, the time timer can be very, very helpful. Making a to-do list or the person making a to-do list, making visual reminders, visual schedules, those can be helpful for the entire class and minimizing that free time, as I mentioned. I'll also talk or show you now a couple of the um, structured, um, sorry, the, uh, the more concrete ways that we can address learning. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with a number line. Having number lines readily available for math can be incredibly helpful, even if it's far beyond the years where number lines are generally used. Number lines help make numbers more concrete. And for people who have FASD, they may use a number line right into their junior high years of school. And it can be a very, very helpful strategy that they're already familiar with if they've learned it in grade two, three, four, five, and then to keep on using it throughout. Another sort of thing that can be helpful for people who have FASD are practicing time, practicing telling time. So cards like this, that on the other side, that has the time here and then a digital time here can be a helpful way of practicing reading time or playing games around what time you have to do things. Um, you know, bedtime is so-and-so, uh, class time is so-and-so, lunch hour is this time, and so on. In terms of math and multiplication, let me just open. The use of these blocks, um, again, might be used in grade two, three, four, but can be very, very helpful. Um, right into junior high, high school years for people who have FASD. Um, also making sure that they might have some of those available for them at home um, or encouraging parents to check out a website that where they can purchase them. And here is a very well-loved um, hundreds chart. And it goes right from one to 400 and has uh, all the multiple, well, not hundreds charts, right? It's a multiplication chart. Um, again, a very, very helpful uh, strategy to keep in a binder as a reference um, because it's knowledge that we assume people learn and just maintain. Um, and often the more advanced math skills coming later in the school years build on that multiplication. And without that really solid foundation, um, or with the forgetfulness of what, you know, two times five is, um, it can be make all math very frustrating when you can't, when you always end up with a calculation error because of a, a multiplication or a subtraction issue. So that's why I say maintaining the, keeping the number line around, keeping the multiplication charts around for reference can be very, very helpful. All right, then we wanna try to use effective communication. So being direct as possible, using as few words as possible, looking for misinterpretations in our words or actions and discuss them when they occur. So sayings like keep your eye on the ball might be interpreted in a very literal way. Uh, my child, one of my children was about 13 before we realized that she'd heard don't drink and drive as on the radio, on billboards, you know, and before she mentioned to me that, but you drink and drive all the time. And I was sort of alarmed and said, what do you mean? She said, but you drink your coffee every morning when you drop me off at school. Because her understanding of don't drink and drive was a very literal, do not drink liquids while you're driving, not do not drink alcohol. So we have to look for these misinterpretations. And, you know, I've said that's 
story before when I've been giving trainings to parents and they've said, you know, that's funny. My kid with FASD had the exact same misinterpretation about drinking and driving. And so we want to think about our language, being consistent in our language. Then if we call something the cubby, you know, don't call it the locker tomorrow, making sure that we're consistent across days and across weeks and months. Um, and for that reason, it can be a real struggle point sometimes when teachers are out sick or away and they have a substitute in their place. Students with FASD can often struggle during those days because everything gets sort of thrown off. The teacher, the substitute teacher, despite their best efforts, might be using slightly different language. They might not know the routine. They might not know what strategies that person needs. And so those can be challenging days and perhaps something that we can think about how we plan for uh, substitute teachers coming in. And then being really specific, especially when it comes to the rules. So instead of saying, take your feet off the table, it's, you'd say, can you put your feet on the floor? So you're not telling them what not to do, you're telling them what to do in the rule. And that can be a helpful strategy. Again, just a more concrete, direct way of, of speaking, of communicating. When you're talking to somebody who has FASD, and as, you, as I mentioned earlier, they can interpret information uh, more slowly than they might be able to put it out. You want to be able to check for confirmation that they understand. And if you say, do you understand what I said? They're going to say yes. And if you say, tell me what I just said so that I know you know the instructions, they'll probably repeat them verbatim. If you say, tell me what I mean, tell me what those instructions mean. That's where you might notice there's gaps in their understanding of the instructions that you previously gave. So checking for understanding by saying, what do those instructions mean? Can be ways of making sure that you have an opportunity to, to correct any missing or, you know, communication and so on, or uh, confusion and so on um, before moving on to, to do the task. So I mentioned a couple of these things. Wherever possible, break it into steps. When a task is completed, then give the next step. Keep your language brief as few words as possible. Using the person's name, if you're speaking directly to them, can be helpful. And sometimes we need to slow down. So about FA kids with FASD, we say they might be 10 second children in a one second world. So giving those extra moments to process what's been said and what that means for them, what they have to do with the information that's been said. Those are all strategies that can be helpful. And then we wanna to try to simplify those rules that we have. So make them as simple, concrete, and easy to follow as possible. Use the same words for each rule and follow the same rules. Different teachers who allow different, who have different rules can be incredibly confusing for people who have FASD. If there are times where consequences need to be used, the consequences need to be short term and they need to be specific to the behavior. And uh, this is something that people struggle with because they tend to just wanna give it as consequence of by taking away the thing that the child is very invested in. So, um, you know, they're really into their free time on the iPad, um, but they were, you know, in the class, but at lunch hour, they were out climbing the trees on the school property, which is against school rules. So in that situation, the consequence for climbing the school trees on the playground can't be take away the iPad time later that afternoon during free time when the rest of the class has it, because the child cannot connect what the iPad has to do with the tree. It's just not the connection so that is not going to be made so that the consequence has to be immediate and brief following and directly related to the 
to the rule that's been broken or, or whatever the case might be. So in the case of climbing the tree, the consequence might be if you can't be safely on the playground, you have to stay with the teacher doing the rounds on the playground or you have to come into the school. It, it, it needs to be immediate and it has to be related to the tree and, and related to the playground in general. Um, and then of course, making sure that those cons, sorry, that hurt my dog. <laughs> Ensuring the consequences are consistently applied. Um, if you let a child with FASD do something once, you've created a new rule or tradition. And so it's important to really make sure that we're consistent and that we set ourselves up for success and the person who has FASD by not creating rules or consequences that we can't follow through or that creates stress for us. So one of the things that I sort of ask myself and encourage training participants to think of is who are we punishing with this consequence? And if the answer is you, well, then we need to change the consequence um, because that's never the goal, right? We're trying to create um, you know, consequences that uh, that can actually be learned from, but are also manageable. And sometimes what we have to do with that is decide what behaviors we're gonna let slide and not respond to, and what needs to be responded to because it involves safety and so on. Okay, so now we're gonna do another discussion. Um, so if we were, if there were many of us, we would do a large, we would do this in, in groups, um, but we'll do this together. And so this is really thinking about your school. Our last scenario was thinking about a classroom specific issue. Your school, um, how could they find additional ways to change the environments in supportive ways for people who have FASD? or similar conditions, because you might find that I've said things here today that you go, huh, I think that would be helpful for the kids who have autism, or I think that could be helpful for the children in my class that are really struggling with a parent's separation or that have ADHD, whatever the case might be. And maybe your school has already implemented changes that you have noticed are quite helpful. And so this is a great opportunity to be able to share some of those examples as well. Uh, we don't need the note taker or the group's the spokesperson, so we'll just ignore that instruction, but I'd love to hear from you whoops, um, on uh, what you're already doing that fits within these strategies and what more you might be able to do that could be universally helpful in your school. Um, I'm returning to resource after um, working at our uh, regional center for education for a few years, and I'm going to a new school. So one of the things that I'd love to see in the small elementary school that I'm going to is every classroom having um, a little corner or space as a break space with some calming materials and um, helping the staff to teach how to use that appropriately to for all of the students and um, I think what I'm seeing at this school is that the students with you know various challenges they're always leaving the classroom to go to other spaces and I want them to be welcome and comfortable and happy in those classroom spaces so a lot of the things that you've talked about just with the environment I think I can help the classes uh, to make that more welcoming and, and a safer space for the students. Yeah, that's great. Does Nova Scotia have a policy um, where they can't, where a child can, is, it's very rare for a child to be held back or can a child repeat a year if they're struggling so significantly academically that it's warrant, considered warranted? I'm not sure if there's like a policy or anything like that, but um, I'm an administrator for a building. So um, whenever we have those discussions, like there's kind of a, there's like a, a process that you try and follow, but you know, there's each, each instance is, is quite individualized. So, um, you know, sometimes they say, you know, you should be having these conversations like in March and meeting with the parents and, and really reviewing their progress. Um, it's hard to say like 
it's not that kids are never held back, but it's really weighing like if they were to repeat a grade, um, is it really going to make a difference or is it going to be to the detriment of their like social emotional development? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly depends on the child. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, one Michelle of the things. correct Katrina about that. It is most like a decision discussion that goes between the school, but also with, with home. Mm -hmm. And I know in some cases we had parents deciding that they would prefer their child to stay behind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it will be a go back and forth discussion. Okay, so what are the benefits? What are the pros and the cons of this decision? But yes, we don't have a specific policy. Specific policy. Yeah, so um, one thing that we've noticed and, and seen with children with FASD is that they end up having to be taken out of the class so much, so often to do, um, oh goodness, the words vary by province, but basically to do remedial work um, the more basic work of the year before the two years before that, depending on if it's, you know, LA math, whatever, they miss so much time in the classroom that they're not connecting with the peers, but they're also consistently behind in their current grade level because they're spending so much time in the remedial activities, which are needed. And so, um, that in combination with dismaturity and the reality that they may be socially more at the level of a younger grade. Um, we've seen parents advocate for children to be held back specifically around the age of grade four. There seems to be something there developmentally at which it becomes quite evident that the child is having such a hard time keeping their head above water um, socially and educationally that it becomes beneficial in some cases for children to be held back that one year. We especially see that if the child's been diagnosed with FASD after they started school, because had the parents had the diagnosis prior to the child starting school, they might've chosen to help hold off one more year and give the child one more year of preschool and so on. Um, again, depends on the province's rules around the dates of starting and, and your choices there. But yeah, just something to sort of keep in mind that certainly there's no right or wrong um, um, from a broad sense, but something that we have seen uh, kids with FASD benefit from. What about um, back to this activity, um, those additional ways that your, your classes or schools might be um, supporting people with FASD or things that you've already done? Just to kind of jump off of what, um... Susan was mentioning about like calming spaces um, this year that just ended we were trying to do a push for every classroom to have the materials needed for a calming corner um, so with the help from SAC and um, school funds we um, bought like calming boxes for each classroom with um, you know like lap lizards um, sensory tools and um, egg we bought egg chairs uh, for every classroom just to kind of put there. So um, every classroom would have that area. So for, you know, kids with a FASD could definitely use it, but it's also going along the lines of, you know, everybody can use it if you need it. Um, and just teaching how to use those things effectively. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And Katrina, I was just thinking like, in the classroom, like morning announcements, like maybe about like the length of morning announcement, probably more person at the junior high and high school level. So maybe like reduce how many announcements are provided in the morning. Could support students who have like a time processing lengthy messages. Yeah, especially if they're important announcements. Um, yeah. So also making sure that the announcements that important information is given through another way, whether it's Google Classroom, uh, a school email, the teacher emails, the, you know, the class, the parents and, and students, um, or through like letters that are sent home just with important dates and so on. Such, such a life changing um, kind of uh, strategy <laughs> for everybody's stress level um, and saves, I think, administrators a lot of time getting phone calls from parents going, when is this due? When is that event happening? What is the deadline for this? Yeah. Any other um, supportive ways to, to, uh, to work with kids with FASD, either that you think you could implement or that you've already implemented? I 
I think to go along with what you were just talking about with the announcements, having them in writing, just making anything and everything as visual as possible to have that as an anchor so it doesn't disappear. Yeah, I mean, I would say primary and um, uh, elementary does a very good job of that already. The trouble is the the expectations of kids from say junior high, high school, um, that they're, they're, the expectations placed on them are, are such that it, it's very hard for people who have FASD to remember all of those things. Um, does anybody here teach in a junior high or high school environment or work in that type of environment? From what I hear, it's mostly um, primary and elementary. Um, so um, yeah, so that's probably already being met by the by the school, but certainly something to keep to keep a, an awareness of uh, is the announcements around important things like photo day, uh, picture day, for sure. So when we're thinking about caring for people with FASD or teaching students with FASD, we want to think about routine, keeping things as routine as we can. We want to think about rules and being consistent and simplifying rules as much as we can. We want to think about repetition and the importance of repetition over teaching and over learning and over practicing as being very necessary for people with FASD to help um, sort of master, um, you know, processes and, and practices and techniques, whatever the case might be in skills. When it comes to repetition, if at all possible, teaching material or teaching lessons in the space where it can be used is very helpful. So this is, you know, if there's specific playground rules, being out on the playground while talking about the playground rules can be very helpful versus talking about them in the classroom before going on the playground, especially for the first time. If there's specific bathroom rules, um, you know, put the paper towel in this bin, doing those lessons sometimes in the bathroom, you know, um, things like that. I'm thinking like the beginning of the school year, getting kids back into the routine. All of those can be helpful to teach in the space where you're seeking for them to, to learn it. Same thing for gym and so on. And then relax into the process because, you know, teaching students with different challenges and exceptionalities can be hard. And, you know, changing one thing or implementing one strategy can create a whole new set of circumstances. So just sort of try to relax into the change that you've made, see how it goes, and, you know, revisit your strategies if you find that the one you've implemented is not working or you need to add another one later on. And then we want to try to encourage the self-esteem. So helping the person explore strengths working not to isolate the child, as a couple of folks have already mentioned, uh, trying to know, you know, not have the child always leaving the room because they need the calming space, but rather to have the calming space in the class, if appropriate, um, and if an opportunity arises to address any issues of loss and grief. Providing opportunities for success. This is a, a very important one, especially if students, um, either struggle with their self-esteem or struggle with behavioral issues or both. Because um, being able to uh, encourage and give that positive feedback that they know they're getting attention for positive things that they've done can be very, very helpful in motivating further positive change um, and positive behavior or a belief in themselves. And so that might be trying to provide opportunities for success early in the day setting them up for success that day. Uh, maybe there's a task, maybe they can be the class leader, uh, maybe they can be the, the one who collects the milk order, you know, whatever the case might be, build them up for success or, uh, for that day. And encourage that positive self-talk whenever can. And giving that positive encouragement in a consistent way. Um, so again, thinking about the language and being consistent in how we deliver that message can really matter. And so I just sort of finish with these um, two quotes. 
about adapting our expectations. Because when it comes to classrooms um, and, and schools and teaching students who have FASD, we really need to adapt our expectations. We need to adapt our environments. We need to not try to change the child, but to try to change the environment that the child is in. And so Diane Malvin, who's an FASD um, uh, practitioner, um, says, try differently, not harder. And then there's this other quote, um, if you've told someone a thousand times and he still doesn't change, then it is not he who is the slow learner. And so I think that quote is uh, a lighthearted way of sharing that sometimes it's us who need to rethink our strategies that we're using uh, when we recognize something's not working here. Okay, I'm not gonna keep trying the same thing over and over again. That's the definition of insanity of trying to treat something over and over again and expecting different results. Perhaps it's me who is the slow learner and I need to change my strategy or the way that I'm doing this. I'll end with this comment. There continues to be underdiagnosis in Atlantic Canada, but also nationally and internationally of FASD. So you will all likely have many students you've worked with who have FASD, and you likely will have many more. We have socially acceptable and legal alcohol in our societies. Alcohol accompanies our social get togethers, our celebrations, our uh, life events, you know, grief, death, funerals, all of those things as well, the non-happy times of life. Um, it's how we can cope with stress. It's considered to be sort of an acceptable rite of passage into adulthood. Alcohol is everywhere and it's deeply embedded in us, in our societies. And so that means that we're going to have people who have FASD. We have about 50% of pregnancies in Canada are unplanned. Um, most people don't know they're pregnant until six, four to six weeks in. Most women who have unplanned pregnancies, the age bracket for the highest rates of unplanned pregnancies in our country is the same age bracket for the highest amount of alcohol consumption, which is early 20s. So in Nova Scotia, you might not see a lot of kids that have in their file FASD. But what I encourage you to think about is what children do you work with that have these characteristics or challenges or strengths that you've learned about today? And you can implement those strategies without it there being a formal diagnosis. Because diagnosis is important, but I would argue diagnosis is a pathway. It's not a destination. Ultimately, what needs to follow, whether it's there's a suspected case of FASD or a diagnosed case of FASD, is professionals such as teachers and educators and healthcare professionals and service providers to be willing to work to support people, to support their families and not further stigmatize people. And that's the difference that you as teachers can make by being FASD informed in your classrooms and sort of thinking beyond, oh, well, if someone has FASD, it'll be noted. No, it likely won't. It likely won't, and that's okay, because you have this, some skills now, uh, and you're going to get a list with extra resources where you can look for very detailed resources. I really encourage you to check them out. What educators need to know about FASD, uh, teaching students with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder developed by the province of Alberta and another by the province of Manitoba. Um, to really dive in and look at some of those strategies that are not only helpful for people who have FASD, but also other dis, uh, you know, disabilities, conditions, and exceptionalities, and so on. So I will place in the chat now a link to an evaluation form that you can fill out. And perhaps when Karen circulates the resource list uh, to you all, you will also get the link in that um, email. So I'd like to thank you all for attending and uh, encourage you all to, to check out the resources in the list, but also on our website, we have um, fasdnl.ca, um, fasdnl.ca slash research is where you'll find in more information about the current needs assessment that we have now launched as of this month in all four Atlantic provinces uh, through surveys, and interviews and focus groups for anybody who has 
who has FASD or who has worked with people who have FASD. And of course, you can check us out on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all those good places as well. And I'm going to pop the evaluation form into the chat so you can toggle over there. It's a very quick evaluation form and we really appreciate you taking the time to complete it. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your engagement and your interaction this morning. And uh, it's been really great to, um, to hear from you all and to thank Karen as well and the Department of Education, of course, for organizing today's session.